Welcome to this special Choices and Challenges Forum. The Choices and Challenges series at Virginia Tech explores the human questions, the ethical, social, legal, and political concerns that result from advances in science, medicine, and technology. For more than a decade, the Choices and Challenges programs have considered a wide variety of topics, ranging from breakthroughs in the biological sciences that can change the features of a single microscopic cell to advances in physics and engineering that can alter the way we function in our universe. At this Choices and Challenges Forum, our topic is Reinventing the Human, the Six Million Dollar Body. We are exploring the issues raised by medical science's ability to carry out organ transplantation. On our panel are David Ayers, researcher and vice president at PPL Therapeutics Incorporated. Javi Morim, medical ethicist at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine. William Payne, transplant surgeon at the Fairview University Medical Center in Minneapolis and past president of the United Network for Organ Sharing. Sheila Rothman, social historian at the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. Andrew Rowan, Senior Vice President of the Humane Society of the United States. Evelyn Schuster, Medical Ethicist at the Philadelphia Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Our moderator is George Annis, Chair of the Health Law Department at Boston University's Schools of Medicine and Public Health. Professor Annis has also chaired the Massachusetts Organ Transplant Task Force. The panel was discussing issues related to the use of human organs. The conversation turned when a member of the audience asked this question. I happen to be a uh, kidney transplant recipient myself, but the discussion earlier uh, discussed paying for donations either by cash, in kind, or commutation of, in case of prisoners' death sentences to life sentences or reduction of sentences in exchange for, I would assume, kidney donations. That was what was implied. But there are many organs besides kidneys which cannot be donated by living donors. So that whole discussion becomes rather moot. What do we do in, as an alternative in this case? Oh, what I want to switch actually over is to hearts, and I actually want to begin, I mean, says I think what we've seen uh, is that we got a supply problem, <laughs> and we're probably not going to solve it with existing cadaver donors or even uh, family members or, or sales. So uh, my understanding of correct is that we can go mechanical, we can go uh, xenografts, or we can go some kind of tissue regeneration, and I want to talk about all three. But the first one I want to talk about is, uh, is artificial hearts, because we had some experience with artificial hearts. We now are here in Europe. We got uh, Jarvik back with his little mini artificial heart. We got other people working on it. Are there any philosophical problems with artificial hearts? Well, I think it's a process of, of learning and, and, and making them work, and many of them work. Certainly, they work better now than they did in the beginning, and that's an inevitable uh, uh, progress uh, that we see when we, when we try So is that the direction we should be going in, do you think? Trying to get better mechanical hearts? Well, that, that question implies some knowledge of how it's all going to turn out. Well, who knows? We don't know, know. We don't know that. that <laughs> Barney Clark got the world's first artificial heart. His wife asked if he could still love her, and which brought up real questions about, is the heart special? Do we treat the heart different than any other organ? Is, are we really tapping into some deep human questions and, and issues when we do hearts? Can you still get angry if you have no spleen? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Thankfully, we don't need to do spleen transplants, I mean. <laughs> Oh, why do we treat the heart? I mean, that's even true. Heart surgeons, we used to be well, The reason them I did that, speak. George, was to bring up the obvious point that okay. um, uh, we, the fact that we attach some sort of symbolic, poetic significance mm -hmm. obviously does, does not entail that the, those poetic things follow. Um, okay. It would seem, however, that there is a very important attached question, and that is um, for the emotional aspects, um, for somebody who realizes, oh my goodness, I really don't have a heart. Uh, and, and for whom there may be serious psychological after effects. And so screening people, uh, in s finding some suitable way to screen people uh, f to perhaps uh, 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 screen out those would be unusually uh, susceptible to that problem. I remember once at Columbia we were with the heart transplant team and there was a little boy who was getting ready for a transplant and he was having a lot of problems and thinking about it and so on. And so they had this psychiatrist or someone go in and talk to him. And finally, he, he said what the trouble was. And he said, I keep worrying and wondering whether my new heart will love Jesus. And 
it was a, it was yeah. a very interesting issue, but it was a very much a class of a clash of values because this little boy was very concerned about it. And when we turned to the person, you know, the team, and said, "Well, what did you tell him?" He said, "Well, I explained to him that his heart was a pump." That's great. Very I mean, but so it really depends on where you're coming That's from. Right. And a lot of people, I mean, yeah. as a community, we feel that there shouldn't yeah. be any direction yeah. of uh, directed donation. But a lot of people have different values, and they worry about what it would mean to have a kidney from someone from another race or from someone from another ethnic group. These aren't the values that, that most surgeons, and obviously they're not the values that our country wants. But I think for individual mm -hmm. patients, these kinds of things are, and I've always thought that the story where my heart loved Jesus is really very important. Absolutely. I mean, uh, how many artificial parts would you have to have before you turn <laughs> into a cyborg or a non-human or a reinvented human as our title is today? Oh, quite a few. How many? Um, <laughs> who knows? No, I but mean, you have an artificial heart, you could have an art, you could I be mean, on it's, kidney it's dialysis. I mean, it's a soul transplant. Uh -huh. that, that would do it. As long as it's still your brain, you think you're okay. Is that what you're telling me? You're, uh, I suppose, you know, philosophers uh, worry about it, uh, this under the heading of philosophy of mind and, and yes, personal identity and so forth. And I, I suppose one of the more attractive theories has to do with uh, you are, you retain your identity as a person when you are able to retain your, shall we say, coherent body of, of memories and uh, your, in a sense, your values. This is not to say that you can't change your values. Obviously, we accumulate memories um, over time, and, and yeah, we yeah, change yeah. in many ways. But it's no accident that when someone develops Alzheimer's, that then becomes advanced. So that the person has no memory of who he is, no memory of who uh, his family is, or what have you. That we say, my mother died, my father died a long time ago, even though this living body is still here. It's no yeah, accident that we right. think in those terms. Is it likely that we're ever going to make, be able to engineer a pig that could give a heart to a human? Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, question is when, and when will that be you know, ethically accepted by society? Uh, I think from a scientific point of view, looking at it as a pump and looking at it as a foreign organ from an animal going to a human, we have to solve immunological hurdles. We have to solve uh, some of the biochemical hurdles with how uh, receptors or uh, molecules on the surface of the pig heart respond or, or liver respond to the, the same molecules in a human. So for, I think the scientific hurdles uh, are, are the least of our concerns. There's also uh, safety issues that have to be resolved uh, with viruses that can be transmitted from pigs to humans. So I think the simple answer is yes. Uh, when is going to be dependent on how we can solve those, those immunological and, and, and viral hurdles and then go get it into clinical trials in humans, which is probably uh, four to five years away. The question is, should we cross over between animal and human species? Is it okay to do that? I mean, we have been by tradition seeing humans at the top of the chain of beings. And Aristotle said, I mean, I don't want to, but he said that beautiful definition of human. We stand erect. We have our brain toward the sky. We stand erect because our essence is divine. Never consider that they will use uh, some uh, animal parts to transfer into a human being because our essence, we can talk, we can reason, things that no other animal can do. We are special. We are different. We are above. We are on the top of the chain of beings. So the question is, should we go? Should we cross the line between species? That's the idea. And, and the product, will, would the product be still a human, a human species? And that goes with stem cells, regeneration of stem cells. That goes with artificial heart. What kind of product, what kind of being are we going to create? That Neurons. argument taken to its essence uh, raises questions about human to human transplantation. Because, you know, we're, we, we've never, we don't. I don't worry too much about transplanting the personality of one person into another because the kidney is, is transported. And I don't think that the essence of the pig is, is transplanted to the human if they have a pig kidney functioning for some period of time during their life. Um, the, the whole question of hearts being different yeah. is, is, really, is really a societal or, or cultural we can get over it, you think? Yeah, I think we can get over that. <laughs> I think we're getting over it rapidly as people are walking Andrew, around I'd like uh, to get you to, take, uh, to tell us what the people who think about the welfare of animals think about us moving into... If I may, I'd like to just say... Go, go the, the, um, the heart um, 
I think it does does bring in some differences uh, okay. um, that uh, we we do have to address. I mean, there's no, uh, but the public itself. Let's go back to the xenotransplantation when. The surveys that are done, there have been very few, interestingly enough, very few surveys done of what people would do with the idea of a xenotransplant. But generally speaking, uh, the willingness to accept a, a, an organ, whether it's a heart, whether it's a liver or a kidney from an animal, um, ranges to about 40% saying they would to about 75% saying they would. Depends. It's very important how the question is asked. And so um, one has to... It's it's a it's a, a, a hypothetical that the public's not really sure how to how to deal with. But if it's your life that's being threatened, uh, then the percentage of people willing to accept it goes up dramatically. Um, in terms of uh, the animal issue, I mean this comes back to whether we should be using animals in research in the first place. Um, but I mean there are two issues basically. One is the the killing of an animal uh, in order to save a human life. Uh, or attempt to save a human life, and the other is the welfare question. Uh, and I separate okay. those out into two different categories. And the, the killing issue, I think it must be taken in the context of the fact that we kill 60 million pigs a year to eat. In this country, 960 million worldwide, almost half of them in China, interestingly. Um, and, and so if we can do that and we accept that as a sort of standard uh, form of operation, a standard form of living, then it becomes very difficult to say that um, we, can't have, we can have a pork chop, but we cannot have a, a pig liver or a pig heart. The pork chop is infinitely less necessary uh, than yeah. uh, is an art the uh, animal organ. Um, where, where we at the Humane Society and some members of the animal protection community come in much more strongly is the whole welfare issue and the question of pain and suffering. Pain and suffering, I think, uh, is, is a key, key aspect of the current attention to animal protection in, in this country and in the, the uh, developed world. Again, the question, therefore, what, has got to arise. <laughs> I mean, okay, if you're queasy, don't do it. <laughs> you know, so what? Um, and do you really want to use phil phil philosophical queasiness as a reason to shut, forbid research, shut down research toward the possibility of this? Uh, philosophical queasiness to forbid everyone everywhere from receiving such a transplant? I mean, therefore what? So mm -hmm. you're queasy, therefore what? Mm -hmm. The other thing with respect to the, the animal, uh, I think uh, one of the, the better answers that I heard uh, came in the context of using a baboon heart for the baby Fay situation in California uh, some years ago, was in, in the 1980s, and a colleague of mine piped up and said, well, it's perfectly all right to use baboon hearts as long as it's just the baboons who are already brain dead on respirators. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, no, yeah, I, ju I just want to go back to what you're saying, using animal organs for, for you, you mentioned, you said it's for survival. And it looks to me that it is survival at all costs. So, so w w the, the question is, what the goal? And I want to use that Paul Ramsey beautiful uh, terminology when he said, what are we doing with this organ transplantation? We slash and sutures our way into eternal life. Is that the goal? Is that the goal? Is that what we want to do? When we can, I mean, the, 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 those organ transplantation, and what it really is we do with, with artificial hearts or research or, or supplant, supplant or supplement uh, uh, defective organs. It's expensive, it is extreme, it is a halfway technology. And, and, and it, it, uh, uh, on the other hand, you have, you have millions of, of, of people who, who are uh, some brain damages for, uh, f because of malnutrition. So where is the balance? Where is the equity? Where is the justice? So what the goal? Is that survival at all costs? I mean, most of the criticism of xenotransplantation from the animal protection community is based on science and, and these sorts of public health issues. Very little of it actually comes out of the ethical arena, um, uh, which is interesting. Um, uh, there is some question about the animal suffering, but uh, by and large, most people are saying it's the threat of disease, it's the uh, public health issue, this is expensive, I mean, why are we doing this stuff? It's uh, survival, as you say, at all costs. There is this very large, I think, cosmic question about what is human, what is not human, what is, is it important, uh, what is natural, what is unnatural, uh, that we have to engage in. I don't, I don't think we can simply leave it up to somebody who can buy the, uh, buy the heart. Uh, to do that. We will get the same sorts of debates in our culture over whether or not we should 
allow anybody to have a, a pig transplant uh, 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 over the abortion type of issue. I mean, it's going to be similar in the sense that, wait a minute, you're corrupting humanity. Uh, and, so, and we need to have those debates. So We're having an ethical debate about you know, not doing xenotransplant, about doing xenotransplantation. What about the ethical debate of saying you, know, you don't do it? You know, from, a, from, a, from a surgeon's point of view, I can't speak for Bill, but um, is it ethical if the technology is there and you can save lives and there's a person on a waiting list who's begging for an animal heart, whether it's from a pig or a primate, mm -hmm. is it ethical not to provide that? technology. To I, th I think once the technology comes, there's really nothing you can do to it's stop late, it. Though. It's too late. Mm -hmm. we, when we started this thing, this, I was thinking reinventing the body, the six million dollar body. It goes beyond saving life and we move very quickly, what I call technology creep, from what we invent to save lives to what we do to make ourselves better, to optimize uh, performance and behavior. <clears throat> and we're very much there. I mean, and there's no reason. I mean, most of the people who are getting kidney transplants, in all fairness, are not dying. We're really doing that to, quote, prolong lives. And it's, I mean, it's a very important thing to do. But we can imagine taking transplants and, or, as genetic uh, transfers. You know, some people are, are trying to deal with uh, arthritis to help people who are, who are suffering uh, with, with, with uh, joint disease. But you can imagine athletes are standing there panting for these things. How can I make my joints better? How can I make them stronger? How are we going to, when we know that we're dealing with memory with Alzheimer's, we're dealing that to cure disease? The earlier okay. discussions related to xenotransplantation indicated that it is a possibility. Uh, there was also talk about some of the moral implications of putting animals into humans and some of the financial implications of doing that. One area wasn't covered, and that is with regards to patenting of life. And I'd like to direct the question to Andrew Rowan and also to David Ayers from the standpoint of the animal welfare community and also from the corporate community, uh, which needs to protect uh, its investments. The animal welfare community is uh, basically opposed to the patenting of life. And that comes back to the notion that that increases the, the idea of commodification of animals. The, the, an animal is simply a commodity, a property. I mean, I know that animals are property under our current law, um, but there's a certain ambivalence about that, especially with dogs and cats and the animals that share our lives in our homes. And so um, the things that tend to increase that perception of commodification, and I know that patenting isn't an ownership issue per se, it's a negative, it's a negative ownership property as it will, it prevents other people from doing something, um, but it, it nonetheless has this image of machinery and so on and so forth so that uh, we, we view it as, a, as a problem from that perspe perspective. That being said, I'd like to just comment that we patent life today without congressional uh, mandate. Uh, it's essentially been driven by the courts, the Supreme Court um, approved the patenting of Chakrabarti's microorganism uh, in 1980. I guess you know, I'm the corporate pig at the table, tongue in cheek. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, in order for, uh, for the, a lot of the health sector, a lot of the progress going on in stem cell research and xenotransplantation is in the private sector. And anymore, a, a lot of the leading edge science is actually moving in to the private sector. The only way that sector as a small biotech company, our company for example, can bring in capital and funding to take to make that leading edge research go forward is to protect the intellectual property. That's our value as a company since we're six, seven, eight years away from a product is that intellectual property of those patents. So, you know, in order for that that degree of leading edge science to occur and if it's going to occur in the private sector it's kind of a, the way the system has required, but I agree that it needs to be have federal regulation. Just tell us about stem cell research and what's going on, what's actually happening. <coughs> I mean, it's embryonic, we're talking about uh, pluripotent stem cells, embryonic stem cells. These are cells that are completely, uh, their clock has been turned back to the point where they're at the, the level of a, a two-cell embryo. The cell can become any any cell in the body, a liver cell, uh, a beta cell, a skin cell, a blood cell. And two years ago, there were two groups, uh, one at Johns Hopkins, another one at University of Wisconsin, who uh, isolated uh, human embryonic stem cells um, from discarded uh, human embryos. So there's issues associated with that. Now, that research was funded by Geron, which is in the private sector, mm -hmm. so it was allowed because federal money was not used for it. But now that we've got those cells, 
The challenge is getting to them to go down the pathways that we want them to. If you were to take a human embryonic stem cell or a mouse embryonic stem cell and put it in a tissue culture dish, one of the first things that would grow out of it, if you didn't do anything to it, would be neural cells. And so all the therapies that can go that way. The second one that would probably start to happen is you get cardiac muscle cells. You'd actually see beating heart cells in that dish. And it's pretty weird when you look through, <laughs> through the microscope and you see beating cells. But the, we don't know how to make a cardiac myocyte at this, uh, at, this point, at this time. So you've got to be able now to develop the technologies, the growth factors, the cytokines that actually tell them to become different cell types. So that's the challenge. But, it's, but the thought is someday you'll actually be able to inject a heart that's had a heart attack and rebuild the tissue? Absolutely. true? The comment earlier now we about go back to the this. Almost, the, almost the inevitability of the accumulation of knowledge. Um, you know, once the genie's out, you can't put it back in. Um, it, the, your discussion reminded me of that because we, we've had this, this debate over should we be studying embryonic stem cells? Should we be doing this? Should we be doing this? In the meantime, people over here at, at other centers are saying, well, you don't need to get them from embryos. And now they're developing yes, stem they cells. They're, they're, they're developing. I don't know if they're developing, discovering, finding, them, finding, finding them, yeah. their uh, stem cells that are derived from adult tissue. So there's nothing inevitable about having to use the, embryos. the, the embryos. You, the, the stem cell research will go on, whether we put the brakes on embryonic stem cell research Aren't or not. are stem cells a little more wrinkled, though? <laughs> right. Um, my question is fairly global, and I'll address it uh, to all of you. But it's the question of what is our real goal here which I think is not quite what our stated goals are. If our purpose is to relieve suffering, why do we devote so much energy and so many resources to high-tech medical approaches when there are many more efficient and simple ways to work? You know, I think if, if we've got this vision of, of a, a runaway train that never will stop, um, I think probably the biggest brakes on that train are going to be the financial Money. ones. Right now, the finances are fueling it. Um, indeed, uh, we're, we're, we're right now kind of uh, in the midst of a terrific transition, but up until now, up until the last, say, five, ten years ago, on the whole, um, we had a, fi a healthcare financing system that was a terrific fuel uh, to research and development of new things. But again, think back to that definition of medical necessity, because as soon as something was declared safe and effective by the FDA, if it was a drug or device, bingo, automatic purchase, guaranteed market for whatever uh, company might develop it. And so our science tended to focus on developing all sorts of wonderful, but often very expensive, expensive. new drugs and devices and toys, and of course procedures, because as soon as a procedure is accepted by physicians, oh, well, we have to pay for it. We must, because it's now medically necessary. Um, and so this was a fuel. Uh, helping companies to have an almost unlimited reserve of money to keep developing all this new stuff, which of course would ha be forced to be purchased by the health plans and thereby by the people who pay the premiums. We're finally recognizing, some of us, <laughs> and, and more and more of us are recognizing, you know what, there is not an artesian well of money down there. That's my money they've been sucking out. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden we feel a very light uh, uh, wallet or a light purse or billfold, and we are finally realizing that we are going to have to say, no, we're not going to pay for that. And that is going to be the brakes on the freight train. We and can't afford to have everybody be a $6 million man. I think ultimately we have to recognize that uh, healthcare is a right and not a privilege. And we talk about gift and uh, uh, altruism when someone gives their organs to others. Perhaps we can apply that to change the healthcare system, to apply to transfer those values that people like to give in order to, to make the system more equitable, more fair as it is now. Uh, I think that uh, organ transplantation to alleviate pain and suffering, yes, so long as everybody can have access in an equitable fashion. It has to be fair and not just for the rich. Most of the diseases that we treat are probably preventable. And, um, and we spend an enormous amount of money and effort in this country and in this society on treatment of end stage diseases that in the beginning would be preventable for a pittance, if, if not for nothing. And sometimes we see improvements. I think the decrease in, in uh, coronary 
you know, deaths from coronary heart disease is a product of yes. applying preventive measures. And further early detection and or earlier than that, even prevention of diseases would decrease the demand for transplantation and permit us to treat the patients, all the patients that need it, um, and would preclude a lot of this um, discussion. We invite you to learn more about this topic at our website, www.cis.vt.edu forward slash choices and challenges.